Hey guys, welcome back to Bob Mup Cam. We're carrying on with unit three in this video and we're gonna be looking at trends in the period three oxides. So that's the oxides formed when oxygen reacts with any of the elements in period three. So there's a little question based on the trends we looked at for the alkali metals in the last lesson. Pause the video. Give yourself some time to do that and hopefully you've remembered that ionization energy is the energy required to remove one electron from one mole of a gaseous atom now there are two main factors that influence that that's the principal quantum number aka the number of shells an atom has because that increases the distance from the nucleus and there is also the charge on the nucleus itself, changing the effective nuclear charge. Looking at this video then, we are going to be looking at the period three oxides. So that is all the way across period three. However, we can effectively discount argon from the conversation here as argon does not actually form oxides. So isn't gonna be part of our conversation. So the actual bonding of these oxides change as we go across the periodic table. If we think, looking back to unit four, we know that we're gonna get a mix of ionic or covalent or giant covalent as we look at this period. And that's really gonna be the key to understanding the different physical properties that we're going to see in each of the oxides. So there are three main physical properties we're going to look at in this video. They're not the only physical properties, but they're the ones you need to know for the IB. And they are melting point, boiling point, and electrical conductivity. But again, electrical conductivity, we're going to look at both in the solid state and also in the molten state. Remember molten being when the compound has been melted. I'm going to present this information in a table so we can better see the trends across the period and look at what's going on here. Now, the first row here is oxidation number. Now, oxidation number is effectively the charge. When we do unit nine, we'll look at that in more depth. And when I say charge, I'm talking about charge of the element that is bonded to the oxygen here. So you can see we increase with group number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. However, phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine also have these oxides where the charge on the phosphorus is three plus, sulfur four plus, and chlorine one plus. Now we know from unit four that the bonding of these oxides, when we have the left side of the periodic table, we're going to have ionic bonding. On the right side of the periodic table, when it's covalent to covalent, we're going to have molecular covalent compounds. Now, silicon forms a giant covalent compound, which we also looked at in unit four. None of these molecules conduct electricity when they are a solid. However, if we melt them all, the picture becomes slightly different. As we know from unit four, when we melt ionic compounds, we end up with those mobile ions, positive and negative, that can migrate and conduct electricity. We have no conductivity at the other side of the periodic table because we have those simple covalent compounds held together with only intermolecular forces. And although not explained by what we did in bonding, we do see a very, very low conductivity when we melt silicon dioxide, but that's not properly explained by its bonding. It does have some properties of ionic compounds that we haven't discussed. So the physical properties of group one, two, and three metals are pretty much explained by the fact that they are all ionic compounds, Na2O, Mg2, and Al2O3. These have high melting points, high boiling points. They conduct electricity when molten, and that's all to do with the fact that they exhibit ionic bonding. 
Silicon dioxide's properties are of course a product of its macromolecular covalent structure, which we covered specifically in unit four. And this structure has that characteristic tetrahedral shape, which gives it an incredibly strong structure. All of these individual covalent bonds difficult to break by themselves. And this crystal lattice structure also means that the properties of SiO2 are very strong and it also has a very high melting and boiling point. And that all comes from this repeating structure of strong covalent bonds that continues to go on ad infinitum. When we move over to the right hand side of the periodic table, we see that phosphorus, sulfur and chlorine oxides all form simple covalent molecules. And the reason we know that is because there's not a very large difference in electronegativity between oxygen and these elements. So because there's not a large difference in electronegativity, we're going to form the covalent bonds. And that means that these form small molecules and it's the intermolecular forces that control their properties. So these have low melting and boiling points. Beyond just the physical properties, these oxides show an interesting change in their acid base character as we go across the period. Now, when we're talking about acids and bases, we're talking about acids in the most simple terms being H plus and bases being OH minus. We'll go into more depth about the complexities and other ways to describe acid and bases in unit eight and 18, but in this period, we see that these oxides act differently as we go across the period. We can think of the period as going from left to right, and the oxides on the very left of the period are basic, and the oxides on the very right of the periodic table are acidic. Now, in the middle, we have our special case, which is aluminium oxide. Aluminium oxide is what we call amphoteric. That's Al2O3. And all amphoteric means is that in some situations it will act as a base and some situations it will act as an acid. Think of amphibian, another term that uses that AMP to donate that it can be doing both, either an acid or a base, depending on the conditions. Once again, I'm gonna use a table to kind of summarize this. So I've starred the elements which it's most important that you are very familiar with the reaction of that oxide with water and we'll go through them. So when we have sodium oxide solid reacting with water, we form NaOH in aqueous solution and in aqueous solution that produces our OH minus ions because Na plus and OH minus dissociate as NaOH is a strong base. Again, hold tight for unit eight to go more in depth with that. With magnesium, we have a similar reaction. The magnesium oxide reacts with water to form magnesium hydroxide, aqueous once again. However, this is not such a strong base and so it is weakly basic. It doesn't dissociate into magnesium plus and OH minus ions quite as easily as sodium, so it's weakly basic. Looking at phosphorus, we can look at P4O10 first. That forms H3PO4, that's phosphoric 5 acid where there's a 5 plus charge on the phosphorus. And we can use P4O6, reacts with water to form H3PO3. And in that case, the oxidation state is three on the phosphorus. We can also look at sulfur. Now we can look at SO3 and SO2. If we react SO3 with water, then we end up with what's we called sulfuric acid, which has an oxidation state of six on the sulfur, or we can have sulfurous acid, which has an oxidation state of four on the sulfur when we do the reaction with SO2. We can also look at the reaction of chlorine, uh, which 
we can have either Cl2O7 or Cl2O forming our different chloric acids, which we'll look at in more depth in unit eight, but we'll have an oxidation state of seven and one respectively. So all of these phosphorus, sulfur and chlorine donate protons H plus, and so therefore are acids. And you're gonna to want to be familiar with the reactions of sodium, magnesium, phosphorus and sulfur oxides for your exams. And you may have noticed that I left out aluminium and silicon. So let's have a look at aluminium because it's slightly more complicated because as we said, it's amphoteric, which means that it can show both basic and acidic behavior depending on the environment. So if we react it with HCl, which is an acid, it will act as a base. And if we react it with NaOH, which is a base, then it will act as an acid. And although you don't need to remember these reactions for the IB, let's just have a quick look what it would be like if aluminium oxide was acting as a base. So let's see the reaction as with HCl. We get Al2O3 is gonna react with the HCl and we're going to form aluminium chloride or AlCl3 and of course, we're going to form water. That's how we know a neutralization reaction has occurred. We've got the H2O being formed at the end. However, if we expose this to a solution of concentrated NaOH, it can also act as an acid. So we can have our aluminium oxide, as we did before, reacting with NaOH, which will form NaAlO2. And of course, as it's a neutralization reaction, water will also be formed, showing that aluminium oxide can act as both an acid and a base. Silicon dioxide is slightly different. It's not amphoteric. However, where do we know silicon dioxide from apart from unit four? Well, it is the main component of sand. Yes, sand as in the sand you find at the beaches that is in contact with the ocean. So clearly this doesn't react with water, otherwise beaches would be very different places. However, given the right conditions, SiO2 can act as a weak acid. If it's exposed to basic conditions, then it will fulfill the role of an acid. So it doesn't react directly with water. However, if we expose it to a base, it will act as an acid. For example, SiO2 plus NaOH will form Ni2SiO3 along with water, that telltale sign we've had a neutralization reaction occur. So let's try a couple of questions. What happens to the reactivity of electrical conductivity when molten in the period three oxides? Pause the video to have a go. Pop them up. Yes, hopefully we realize that as we go across the group, we're going from ionic to covalent. Ionic is going to conduct when molten, covalent will not. So we're going to see a general trend of decreasing molten electrical conductivity as we go across period three. Next question, which elements oxide is amphoteric? Pause the video. Pop them up. It is of course, aluminium oxide, Al2O3. Following that, which groups of the periodic table have oxides that form basic solutions when they react with water? Pause the video. Pop them up. Well, the first clue you get with this one is group one are called the alkali metals, and it is gonna be group one and group two metals form their metal hydroxides when they react with water. We did say group one reacts a little bit faster than the group two, but they all react 
to form their metal hydroxide plus hydrogen. Last question then, complete the equation for the reaction of sulfur dioxide with water to form sulfurous for acid. Pause the video to give yourself some thinking time. Pop em up. So remembering when we've used SO2, we're going to get our sulfurous acid. So it's going to be H2SO3 aqueous as our product. Okay, guys, definitely questions that you can be doing for this as we round out the SL component of this topic. Thanks again for joining me, guys. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit that bell icon. And as always, practice makes slightly better.